So what I'd like to talk about today is the whole area of how we think about the curriculum and how we think about the curriculum in relation to digital engagement and digital learning and teaching within higher education. There are a few things that I'd like to explore over the next half hour or so. Um, what our notions of curriculum are, um, exploring the idea of um, third space and digital third space in relation to learning and teaching and the curriculum. What's happening in our schools at the moment, this was alluded to in the, the opening address, and why that's important, how we have to think about the curriculum in higher education and how we have to think about technology. And then I'd like to conclude by looking at um, some things we can think about in terms of how we harness technology and curriculum design and how we start to explore the broader possibilities for how we might think about developing the, the curriculum and digital practice within universities. There are two sort of framing propositions or underlying assumptions, if you like, that, that will run throughout everything I'm going to say. Um, you don't have to agree with these, and it might be um, a bit more interesting if, if some of you didn't agree with these. But these are the things that kind of anchor how I think about curriculum and technology, and, and they anchor some of what's about to follow. Um, one is that the most effective uses of technology in education aren't about providing content, although that is important, but they're about providing spaces for our learners to create and to engage with themselves, with ourselves, and with the broader communities and discipline areas that they're going to enter into. Aligned to this, I would say that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes our notions of curriculum and higher education are bounded by assumptions about space and place within programmes, within modules, uh, within the virtual learning environment. Um, now, it's, it's important that we we systemise and, and we have a way to manage the curriculum. But I do think that there are certain barriers and, and certain potential that's inhibited when we start saying or making assumptions about, well, you, you have this matriculation number, so you, you belong to this module, and this is what you'll see within the VLE. And you have this matriculation number and you belong to this programme. This is when your classes will be timetabled for a space like this. So I think we need to think about some of those things. Um, uh, it, they're important but they can inhibit what we do sometimes. However, before we start looking at a curriculum, I'd really like to know, what are your ideas about curriculum? What does curriculum mean to you? If someone says, what is the curriculum? What are the first things you start to think about? Um, so I'd be really happy just to take a couple of you know, quick fire responses from the audience. Um, what does curriculum mean for you? What do you think it involves? And I will pick on people. I only know three names of the people in the audience, so that, you, know, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> Any, would anyone like to start? What does curriculum mean to you? Um, the range of knowledge and um, understanding that you're focusing on. Right. Range of knowledge and understanding, yeah, absolutely. Any others? Uh -huh, how we structure the whole sort of learning experience and how we want our learners to get from here to there. Mm -hmm. yeah. any, any other ideas, suggestions? <coughs> Yeah, and, and, and there's something really important there, which we may or may not touch upon, depending on time, around um, who are our stakeholders in the curriculum, for want of a better word. Um, and sometimes we're empowered or we're limited in what we can do by what external bodies say. Um, and I think that's a problem. Um, uh, I think it's an understandable problem. I think accrediting bodies probably have the same ideas about higher education that architects do when they come to design a new campus and they focus on a big, shiny new lecture theatre. Um, it's what they were used to. So when accrediting bodies say you'll be assessed by a 3,000-word written essay um, or, or you know, a two-hour exam, you know, that, that's hard to break away from. But we need to confront some of these things, I think. OK. There's lots of things that, that make up the curriculum and how we might think about it, what we want our learners to be able to do and achieve, um, how we'll structure how they get there, um, uh, how we compete or, or balance what we want to do with the demands of accrediting bodies and other external kind of stakeholders, if you like. I think this is a fairly decent broad view of the curriculum, kind of Prince definition. All the planned learning opportunities offered by the organisation to learners and the experiences they encounter when the curriculum is implemented. I think that's a fairly quite broad, quite decent view of the curriculum. I think it's a little bit limited. I think um, there are hints in that broader definition about 
who owns the curriculum and, and, and hints that it's something that we do and provide to our learners and I think that needs to be challenged. But I think that's a fairly inclusive uh, view. I think we can go beyond this. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the QA enhancement theme in Scotland, we have these things every three years or so, was about um, sort of reconceptualising the curriculum. Uh, and there's some interesting ideas coming out there around the curriculum as a vehicle. So not just what we want to do and what we want our learners to learn and how we'll teach it, but how the curriculum can meet kind of broader needs and demands. Um, you won't be able to read all of this, but not just around our institutional priorities, but around things like widening access, social responsibility, um, higher education as a public good, and how we extend the curriculum to meet some of those <coughs> broader um, societal needs and challenges. So there's other views around the curriculum as well. I'd like to suggest that there are other important things we need to think about when we think about <laughs> the curriculum in relation to digital practice and higher education. Um, I think one of those important ideas is the idea of third space. Is anyone familiar with the, the, the basic idea of third space? It's something that's gained traction, particularly over the last 20, 25 years um, or so. Uh, and originally the idea of kind of third place or third space was about those spaces in the communities where people could come together around shared interests. And Ray Oldenburg was one of the people that first defined this in a fantastic book called The Great Good Place. Um, cafes, coffee shops, bookstores, um, dot, 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 other hangouts at the heart of our community. Now the basic idea of third space, the basic characteristics, is that they're not work and they're not home. They're neutral spaces where people can feel welcome. Um, so the pubs, galleries, libraries, the park. Difference is embraced in third space. Um, what people bring in is respected, but status doesn't really count. That's an important aspect of third space. Social status is irrelevant. Knowledge is shared for a collective good. That's another important aspect of the idea of third space. And then there's um, two important aspects that relate particularly to notions of third space as they relate to digitally enhanced higher education. There's a lot of discussion about third space in relation to technology education at the moment. Third space can bring together people who wouldn't otherwise meet. And I'll say a bit more about that. And digital third spaces, where it brings together people that wouldn't otherwise meet, and where people can cluster around shared interests, and cluster is a really important word, can help amplify issues beyond that third space and take them out into other groups and other areas of society. And I'll come back to that too. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of practice, really good practice happening, um, that harnesses the idea of third space within higher education and takes it out into the community and makes higher education more accessible um, for those that want to benefit from it. And not necessarily those that, that have been in higher education. Um, a few projects, the Free University Brighton, um, Education for Love, Not Money, really nice idea. They're about to offer a free degree in higher education for anyone that feels they want to benefit from that. The Social Science Centre in Lincoln, Free Corporate of Higher Education is their kind of strap line. Um, uh, this came out of um, a lot of work at the University of Lincoln and now academics in the region and others, scholars, artisans, are providing free access to higher education in the community. And the Ragged University, knowledge is power but only when it's shared. Um, a project that's founded on the idea of third space and which uses pubs, libraries, spaces in the community to bring together academics and scholars with those that want to learn. And that's really, really important. Some of these things have massive implications for what we do in higher education and I would argue how we think about the curriculum as well and how we need to think about the curriculum. A definition for today around the idea of third space. Third spaces, um, I would say, are spaces or annexes. Annex is a nice word, I think, in this context. That expand, extend our opportunities for engaging with learners both within and beyond the university. And I'll come back to the, the whole within and beyond. Digital third spaces are spaces that allow us to make connections between different groups of learners within and beyond the university. They allow our students to connect with the wider communities and professional communities and discipline-related communities they either belong to or they're going to belong to. And also allows our universities to better connect with the, the communities that they sit within, where the campuses are based, where the activities of the university are based. And I'll come back to that too. Why is some of this important? Um, I think there's a number of reasons. Um, I think, uh, first and foremost, um, starting where our learners start at school, there are a number of really interesting 
things, quite fundamental changes happening in schools at the moment that have huge implications for how we engage learners in higher education. Um, within Scotland, and I'll use this as an example just because it's one I'm most familiar with, we implemented a few years ago in uh, primary and secondary schools the Curriculum for Excellence. Can I just see a show of hands for anyone that's heard of that? And, and some of you may well know more about it than me. I've got an interest in it um, as an educator. I think it's got big implications for how learners coming through the Scottish system, what they'll expect when they go to university, wherever they go to university. But the Curriculum for Excellence is based around four dimensions. Uh, successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens, effective contributors. Some of the things that are in each of those dimensions are things you would expect, things that we want to instill within our learners. So the idea within successful learners that we, um, uh, our learners are enthusiastic and they're motivated to learn. The idea that um, they can use literacy and communication skills um, uh, to good effect in different contexts. They can use technology for learning. That they're responsible citizens. They've got respect for others. Uh, they can develop knowledge and understanding of their own context and wider global contexts. Effective contributors, they're able to communicate in different ways in different settings. They can participate in different ways. Um, in terms of being confident individuals, they've got self-respect. They respect others. Um, they're able to manage themselves and um, they're able to develop and communicate their own ideas um, in the context of other people's views. Now, these are all things that good teachers have been doing for a long, long, long time. However, what's quite interesting about the Curriculum for Excellence is the way in which it's being implemented and the focus that it's putting on increased learner autonomy, increased learner choice, learners as makers or digital makers, collaborating to create artifacts that evidence their learning, having some dis key decisions to make around what they'll put forward, how they'll be assessed, um, how they're going to evidence what they've learned. Now, I've experienced this, some, uh, some of this firsthand as a dad. And one of the, um, a very kind of recent thing that happened to us was a, a project that one of our, our girls was asked to undertake um, in primary five, um, year before last, where they were asked to look at um, famous figures from Scottish history. And this resulted in me finding out about the implications of the curriculum for excellence from the most unlikely of sources, a gentleman called Sonny Bean. Um, now, this is a long shot, um, particularly on this side of the border. But has anyone heard of Sonny Bean? I know Peter has, yes. Anyone else? A couple, brilliant. Um, has anyone seen the horror film, The Hills Have Eyes? Yeah. Right, OK. Then you know a little bit about Sonny Bean, because that's based on the Sonny Bean legend. Um, if you've not seen The Hills Have Eyes, um, really good film. Don't watch it on your own in a darkened room feeling slightly paranoid, or if you do, don't say you've not been warned. So Sonny Bean, um, thankfully not a teacher, um, was a cannibal that lived in a cave with his family on the west coast of Scotland in about the 16th century, we think. That's kind of open to, to question. Sonny Bean and his family um, used to sustain themselves by robbing passers-by of all the worldly, worldly goods and everything else they had about them. And my daughter came home and said, um, we've got to do this, this project on a famous historical Scottish figure. Um, I'm not sure who to do. Um, I said, well, have you got any ideas? What about Robert the Bruce? No, there's two Robert the Bruce already. William Wallace. There's about five William Wallace. Um, Rabbi Burns, dad, that's too obvious. Um, so, OK, well, let's, let's go and have a look. So she went online and she found a site, a website, that was about lesser known Scottish historical figures. And being slightly, having slight gothic tendencies, um, our second oldest daughter, um, she saw Sonny Bean and said, Sonny Bean, a cannibal, that's for me. That's what I'm doing my project on. <laughs> so what she did was she researched Sonny Bean. She found some YouTube clips that, that gave presentations about the, the, the legend of Sonny Bean. Um, she asked to watch The Hills Have Eyes. It said, you're not watching that for at least another 10 years. But you know, um, she found video clips. She decided that she would evidence a project because this was really interesting. The teacher said, pick anyone you like, evidence what you found about them in any way you want. You can do a poster, you can do a presentation, you can come dressed up and do a talk with them, anything you like. So Eva decided that she wanted to create Sonny Bean's cave um, with Ollie's family. So she found the YouTube clips online about Sonny Bean and various other things she read about them. She um, went on to YouTube and found um, a video that showed her how to make a paper mache cave. 
Then she went to find instructions about how you make small skeleton figures out of kind of oven clay and went and made all of those. And she created Sonny Bean's cave and a poster with a QR code that would take people to video clips. And that was her presentation. That's what she took into school. All the parents were invited in. We got there. Um, it was amazing. You know, the kids had all undertaken this task, a well-defined structured task, but in a whole range of different ways that they were all really motivated by and that they were all able to show their own creativity through. Um, and there was a few Robert the Bruce, and they looked really good, and there was quite a few Rabbi Burns, too many Rabbi Burns, really. Um, and there was a, but there was a few other characters that I'd never heard of and that the teacher hadn't heard of. Now, this was really interesting. The teacher had never heard of Sonny Bean. Um, the only thing I remember from primary school, just about, because we did a project on, on Scottish folklore and history as well, was Sonny Bean. And about the only thing I can remember accurately from primary school was the rhyme, Sonny Bean, Sonny Bean, the hungriest man you've ever seen. Um, <laughs> now, I think, I think that says something about learning in creative ways. That's about the only thing I can remember from primary school, I think. It's certainly the thing that's most accessible. Um, and plus the idea that Sonny Bean just scared the bejesus out of me as well. Um, so that, that was also a factor. Um, but the teacher hadn't heard. So here we have students learning through a curriculum that gives them choice, autonomy, the opportunity to be creative, and bringing things into the classroom that the teacher hadn't heard of, and putting the teacher in a co-learning position. And I think that's really, really powerful. And I think we see a lot, of, a lot of that happening when our students engage in online communities, and they're able to bring things back in. Um, and I'll come back to that. So Sonny Bean, an important example. Our eldest daughter um, went into secondary school last year. I won't labour this point, but another brief example. Um, her history class, they did um, Stone Age history, and they looked at diet, and they looked at shelter, and they looked at clothing. They too were told at the end of their history um, class, go off and produce a project that captures everything we've covered over the last eight weeks about Stone Age history. Do it in any way you want, any way you want. So Freya decided to do it in the style of a holiday brochure. Come to Stonehaven Holidays for a rocking holiday experience. Let me just give you a quick example of this. So she did it in a really authentic way. She looked at different examples of holiday brochures. She found pictures online of the kind of wildlife that would have been around at the time, of caves, and then produced a holiday brochure that captured everything she'd learned in the Stone Age history class, but in a way that she wanted to do it. So, accommodation. So you've got the factual stuff. That's too high up there to read. And the Stone Age shelters would be made to, build quick, to, be, made, made to be built quickly and take down quickly as most people move their homes along with the seasons. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but then it gets, you know, she brings in her own creativity. Um, at Stonehaven Holidays, we give you a choice of building your own teepee when you arrive or trying to find a cave somewhere in the holiday park. We don't supply materials for your teepee and you might have to fight for a cave. Um, <laughs> but, you know, really engaging stuff. Um, fine dining, catch it yourself. Crafting and weapons. Fashion, workshop, fashion workshops with discerning Stone Age holiday maker. Um, this, but this wasn't the only project like this. The, the students in the class done it in a whole range of ways, creating really interesting digital artefacts and owning that part of their curriculum, owning that activity. Um, that's what our students, our, our learners are doing in schools at the moment. And it's not just the curriculum for excellence in Scotland. This whole thing about maker or digital maker pedagogy is becoming much more prevalent in the school sector, um, uh, I would argue, across many countries in the world. Um, and I, I think we need to ask a really important question. And when I can get back onto the slides, I'll ask that question. What are the expectations of our learners from school going to be if they've had a choice to define their own curriculum, learn in creative, motivating ways, develop the digital skills through making things and creating things? What's their experience going to be like when they come to university? What are their expectations going to be? Now, there's lots of crack and practice happening in universities um, across the UK and beyond. But I think it's probably also the case that traditional teaching activities, lectures, essays, exams, still prevail a lot of the time. Now, there's a, we need, there's a, absolute, there's a place for these things, absolutely. But 
We also need to recognise that what's happening in schools and how people are learning formally and informally out with formal higher education is much more like what we've just seen than what they'll sometimes experience when they come into spaces like this, to learn in ways like this. And that, that's, you know, there's something fundamental that we need to grasp. So how do we harness technology in higher education curriculum design? Um, many of you will have great ideas and, and be doing lots of good things already. Um, I'll share a little bit about my own experience um, and things that I think work and have found to work well. Um, about 10 years ago or so, I was fortunate enough to be involved in a large cross-institutional project in Scotland. It involved FE uh, and HE partners called the TSET project, um, transforming, enhancing the student experience through pedagogy. Um, the project was essentially about redesigning FE and HE courses and curricula to use, at the time, current and emerging technologies to allow learners some control over what they were learning and how they were learning, and some choice and control over how they evidenced that learning. So with a focus on making use of digital spaces to create and to engage, and with a focus on there always being collaborative activity of some kind or another. Now, within the TSET project, we looked at redesigning uh, FE and HE curricula from apprenticeships all the way through to master's programmes in music theory. Everyone coming from different places, uh, everyone doing different things at different levels. So how do we take ideas around digital maker practices, as we'd probably call them now, social constructivism, and, and, and you know, get that into a shape that, that learners, uh, that our tutors can work with? One of the tools we developed to do that was something called the three-year approach, which is a simple design framework to think about um, embedding some of those principles in learning and teaching and the redesign of curriculum. And the basic idea was that there was a three-year continuum going in, through from enhance, through to extend, through to empower, where at the enhanced level, you're making some simple adjustments to your learning practice and your teaching practice to make the learning experience a bit more active, give the learners a bit more control. At the extend level, you were introducing activities that gave learners at least some key decisions to make about what to learn, how they would learn it, what they would produce. And then at the empower level, it was about redesigning the courses and the curriculum to ensure that learners' needs drove the experience from the outset and to try and ensure that they were learning in ways that reflected as closely as possible how knowledge is created, shared, used in the real world and in the professions that the learners were preparing for. This isn't a hierarchy. The whole point is that you, you start and end up at different points on this continuum based on the skill of the tutor, the level of the learning, the experience of the learners. Um, but there is, in, in here there is a, um, a suggestion built into this that in terms of planning progression through the curriculum and through learning, we start enhance, uh, and certainly by the time students get to third year or fourth year or master's level, they should certainly be doing things at the empower end of the curriculum. So that was a simple tool that we used um, to inform the redesign of, in the end, about 80 different courses across FE and HE. A few years ago in Edinburgh Napier, we revisited the three approach when we were looking at how could we try and uh, encourage a more active use of technology in learning and teaching and the design and delivery of the curriculum across the whole of Edinburgh Napier University. So we reconceptualised the three approach as a three framework, put a bit more focus on technology. So at Enhance, we're talking about <coughs> using technology to underpin activities that get learners to be a bit more active and empower a more developed use of technology to underpin higher order individual and collaborative activities that will get learners to take more responsibility and to learn in ways that reflect the real world or the professions <coughs> they're preparing for. But it was a learning and teaching focus framework. It wasn't organised around technology, it was organised around learning and teaching challenges, seminar participation, large, cla uh, large class teaching, field work. Uh, and all the, uh, all the examples in here were tried and tested in that original FEHE project. So it was evidence based. <laughs> now, we were quite fortunate in that um, when we made the three framework available, Creative Commons, at the end of 2011, we found quite a, a number of other institutions um, took it, either as it was or adapted it, to inform their own activities around embedding technology in the curriculum, uh, and in some cases in redesigning the curriculum. So I can't speak a word of Greek, I don't read a word of Greek, but that, that diagram in the middle, that screenshot, is from a Greek schools project that ran a couple of years ago, um, which the Greek government funded, um, I guess before they ran out of money. Um, but um, this was a project that funded uh, a range of teachers from schools and secondary schools, primary and secondary schools across Greece, 
to redesign the curriculum at primary and secondary level um, to make more effective use of technology in digital spaces. Uh, and the three framework was a reference point for doing that. It's been used in a number of other universities as a focus of strategy for technology enhanced learning. Um, but for me, it's where it's been used to think about the curriculum that's been most powerful. Um, and all the best examples, I would argue, that are out there are from other institutions that took this and ran with it rather than what we did with it originally. But one of the ways in which we used it was to think about how we plan progression through a technology-enhanced um, curriculum. Um, and this is an, uh, an example from a postgraduate program where we designed progression through the program against the three E stages. So at the enhanced level, we had learners undertaking um, case studies where they just you know, agreed on issues to focus on within case studies we provided. At the extend level, they identified, researched their own case studies. At the third stage, they were looking at this particular course as an object of study <coughs> and using that as a case study and evaluating the course and seeing how they would redesign the course. Um, but there was you know, lots of other kind of examples there. Um, but for us, there was something about the notion of curriculum and digital space empowerment and ensuring that we can take learners from where we want them to start all the way through to where they need to be at the end of a programme. Now, one of uh, the tasks that's involved was ensuring that by the end of the PG Cert, the learners were set up to take care of their own continued professional development in their chosen areas. And I'll come back and say a bit more about that. In terms of giving you a quick flavour of some of the things that we did in terms of activities, and I won't, I'm not going to touch upon this um, in, in any real detail, but at the enhanced level, where we're getting learners to use technology in digital spaces to be a bit more active and to create things, to be digital, make, digital makers, then um, we use things like collaborative class glossaries. So you take two or three students each week, give them two or three terms to go from research and define, and they contribute to, that, to the, the class glossary in a, a wiki or somewhere on the VLE. You link those terms that are being defined to what's coming up in that week's lecture or next week's tutorial. So that over time, the learners collectively are creating a resource that supports their learning and supports what's happening each week within the class, but also gives you a really valuable digital artifact to take forward to next year's group. And the program I talked about that I took that from was the program Mark mentioned, the MSc in Blended and Online Education. But these activities were the activities that the school teachers on that program or the lecturers or the community educators typically took and embedded in their own practice. These were the ones that were the most popular. At the extend level, giving learners a bit more control, allowing them to take charge of the learning and teaching activities through things like student-led seminars. So taking you know, small groups of students and getting them to lead some sort of online activity um, or blended activity over two or three weeks for the rest of the cohort. So they design things like web quests where they find a series of resources that they get their colleagues going to explore and then come into an online discussion or something face-to-face -face and discuss what they'd learned from those resources. Um, things like um, guest experts, where the learners went out and found someone that knew about the field or discipline that everyone was preparing for, brought them in and organised a session for the peers around that. Now, there's something in here that I think is really important about that old adage. It's an old adage because it's important that the best way to learn something is to teach it. And I think we need to think about what we do within the curriculum to give some of the intellectual effort that we put into designing the curriculum and learning and teaching, give some of that effort to our learners so that they can benefit from it um, in, in ways that might be a bit more creative and a bit more engaging. And I mentioned this example of um, ensuring that learners were able to look after their own continued professional development beyond the end of the programme. And one of the activities that we looked at here, or that we often used, and that the teachers and lecturers on the program very often took into their own practice, was an activity, an assessed activity, where the learners go out and join, find and join, online or online supported professional communities in their discipline area, or in the vocational area they're preparing for. They join these communities, they take part in some of the discussions. Um, they, they come back online, tell their peers about the community they found, what they did there, and the, the extent to which they think it would be useful for others to engage with. And then what happens is you've got a cohort of learners that between them have created a directory of communities, of places and spaces that they can go to when they leave their programme to keep up to date, to look after their own continued professional development and their own lifelong learning, 
And much more importantly, they're starting to engage with the communities, the professional communities they're going to join way before they get there. It's not something they do after they graduate. And, and we need to think about how we broaden what we do within the curriculum and we broaden our uses of digital space so that engagement through the curriculum and the activities of the curriculum go out into the communities that the, the learners have to join. Um, we need to think really carefully this notion of distributed curriculum, I think. There are other really important models to think about. I mentioned the Social Science Centre in Lincoln and what they're doing to provide um, free access to higher education in the community. Uh, the Students Producer Project at University of Lincoln is a really interesting one in thinking about how to reconceptualise the curriculum. It started out as a pilot project in a number of areas where they were looking at redesigning learning and teaching and the curriculum to be um, research-led wherever possible. So the learners were in the role of researchers and investigators. They were producing artefacts, social issue reports, um, business consultations for the small business or you know, the small third sector group trying to start up down the road. They were producing things that had a wider relevance beyond them simply being assessed and then that written work being put away and never looked at again. And I think we need to think really carefully about how the curriculum and the activities of the curriculum can provide a public good and a wider good to the communities that our learners engage with and the communities our universities sit within. Technology there wasn't a driver, but technology provided the space and the means to produce some of these artefacts and to get them out there into the communities. Vertical and horizontal projects, um, and, and Peter introduced me to this idea a couple of years ago, work at Strathclyde run vertically integrated projects that go from the first year of an undergraduate course all the way up to honours year. The projects that everyone's involved in across the, all levels of the programme. The first year undergraduates are the novice researchers. They're given particular tasks to undertake. As they progress to second year, they take a more responsibility. And again in third year, and maybe in fourth year, or if they're master's students, they're the PI for that project. They're the project coordinator. Now typically these projects are industry focused. Sometimes they're consultations or pieces of work for the industries the learners are preparing for. But what's really interesting about this is how it takes the notion of curriculum and takes it beyond you're in the level one cohort, this is where you do your stuff. You're in level two, this is a box you fit into. And it gives people shared activities that stretch across all levels of a program. And it provides the learners with an insight and a scaffold to see, okay, this is what they're doing in second year. This is what my third year colleagues are doing. That's where the curriculum's gonna take me. And that becomes really quite important, I think. Not just in terms of things like research-based learning, but employability skills, um, our students developing the wider skills and attributes that they need. Again, technology here is an enabler. It's providing space. Uh, and more often than not, the technology isn't always the VLE. The VLE does great things. What the VLE is not very good for is allowing students from different programmes, from different discipline areas, to cluster together to do shared projects around shared interests. Negotiated open online learning. Um, I think um, there's lots of good things happening around open online education. Uh, there are lots of things, interesting things happening with large scale open online courses. Um, I'll avoid using the obvious word. Um, however, I think there's a bit of a problem. I think the, uh, the promise of open online education hasn't been fulfilled. It hasn't widened access to, to higher education for those that want to get there. In most cases, it's amplified access to higher education for those that have already got a higher education. So there's something we need to do to think about how we can reconceptualize uh, <coughs> curricula or ideas of education to make it more inclusive and to widen access. This is an example from Leeds Scotland. Uh, Leeds Scotland are a charity in Scotland linking education and disability that work across Scotland to provide educational opportunities for disabled learners and their carers to access education and training. Now, it's always difficult and dangerous to generalise, but in many cases, the learners that Leeds Scotland supports have been disenfranchised um, and disadvantaged in the formal education system um, through their disability. It's made things difficult in terms of their engagement. Some of these learners don't have the traditional qualifications, but they've got aspirations like any of us, and they've got things they want to do. So this approach was very simple. It was an online, short online course over three months that said to learners that are aspiring to get into further or perhaps higher education, what are you interested in and how can we help you evidence your learning? The course was based around um, a series of uh, 
individual and online supported tasks, where the learners picked something they were interested in. It's interesting. It could be anything. It could be their favourite football club. Um, but it could be joinery, if they wanted to get into a joinery course at FE College. It could be um, hairdressing. It could be anything they were interested in. The course supported them in putting together a digital artefact, researching their subject, bringing together what they've learned, and producing a digital artefact, a YouTube channel, a blog, a website, a series of podcasts that captured what they'd learned about that subject. They were assessed at SCQF level six, which is like you know, an FE level. Um, they were assessed, but they weren't assessed on the subject matter, because that would have been too difficult. You know, um, a small charity supporting a range of learners with different interests. They were assessed on the digital skills they were able to evidence having developed through creating their digital artifact. And they could then go to college, a further education college, and say, I don't have this background, but I've done this thinking digitally course. Here's the, the project I've put together about all the, the, you know, the big joinery projects in Edinburgh at the moment. And here's the, the, the assessment I've passed that shows that I can study at FE level and it shows I've also developed a range of digital skills and literacies that I can bring into a course if you'll give me a chance. I think that's much more powerful in terms of open education and widening access to tertiary education, including FE and HE. How do we explore the broader possibilities of this for our universities? I think there's a number of ways we can do that. I'll share briefly some work we did at Edmund Napier a couple of years ago. We undertook an institutional-wide <coughs> digital futures consultation the aim of this consultation was to try and gauge where, you know, uh, where Edmund Napier was at in terms of its digital practice and provision and where it would go as a digital university. Now, digital university doesn't mean a fully online university or a university that's digital in everything that it does for the sake of it. Um, we were thinking about a digital, un digital univers university's meaning, a university that makes good progressive use of digital tools and practices and spaces wherever possible to support the learning experience, to support scholarship, and the broader staff and student experience. Now, we looked at six themes within that consultation, doing internal and external benchmarking, and trying to come up with um, a vision for how Edmund Napier would progress in terms of its digital practice. A key reference point for this, with, uh, for us within this work, was Sheila McNeil and Bill Johnston's um, work around uh, conceptualizing the digital university. They've got a conceptual matrix for the digital university, which I would really encourage you to check out. Um, it talks about different dimensions of the digital university around participation, civic roles and responsibilities, community engagement. So I keep doing that. Um, you know, digital spaces that will allow learners to engage with the wider community. It looked at information literacy, including for staff and students. It looked at curriculum and course design. What does a curriculum look like in a digital university? What does a curriculum look like when universities um, grasp the potential for using digital tools and practices in digital spaces to make the curriculum all that it could be? It's a really central question to some of this work. So we looked at the, this was a starting point for us, it informed our work at Edinburgh Napier and informed some of our key decisions. And one of the things that, that came out of that digital futures consultation for us while I was at Edmund Napier until last year was that some of the things that we were seeing could be quite nicely organized or brought together under the organizing concept of the digitally distributed curriculum. A curriculum that uses digital spaces to support particip participation in professional communities, that engages our learners wherever possible in the communities they're eventually gonna join, that was sustainable Sustainable curricula was a big part of this proposed model. Um, through things like digital maker approaches, digital pedagogies, where learners would create things, perhaps that collaborative class glossary, that would have a relevance next time around and make our own teaching role a bit more sustainable and allow us to do more interesting things when we've got our learners face-to-face, -face, whether it's online face-to-face -face or in the classroom face-to-face. -face. We're also keen looking at things like vertically and horizontally integrated projects, that a digitally distributed curriculum would support cross-campus and cross-program collaboration. Digital space would allow learners from different disciplines to come together and do things and learn from one another. It would also introduce digital scholarship opportunities for learners. Um, we think about digital scholarship largely in relation to our own academic work and how we share it. Actually, 
I think, a logical extension to things like the Curriculum for Excellence in Scotland or the digital maker things that are happening within schools. A logical extension to that in higher education is as the student, the higher education student, as a digital scholar, creating things that contribute to public bodies of knowledge, creating digital artefacts of a wider relevance than simply writing an essay that will be assessed and never looked at again. Um, letting our learners undertake projects that they can take to employers and say, well, look at these two or three links here. Here's a social issue report that myself and my colleagues worked on on this particular issue. Here's this business consultancy we undertook. Here's this work we did with a small third, third sector um, startup in the local community where we sit. Um, evidencing what they've done and making it shareable and contributing to public bodies of knowledge. These are some of the things we're keen to bring into this. It's not, it's not all of it. Um, and it's only an idea. Edmund Napier have now formed a digital university group to implement the recommendations of the Digital Futures consultation, including this one. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough to be leading that consultation, and this particular idea is one that we're hoping to take forward at UHI as well. So I'll just conclude by saying what's happening at UHI and what might it mean for us. UHI is um, a federation university made up of 13 partner colleges and specialist research institutes all across the Highlands and Islands uh, and Perth. And they're quite keen to point out they're, they're not the Highlands and Islands, but from Perth upwards. Um, we deliver things at local campuses, but we have networked delivery where the same courses are taken uh, in a combination of face-to-face -face and distance delivery from students who are based at different partner colleges. We have learning in the field, we have online delivery. And our Dean of Learning and Teaching kind of talks about this as a kind of natural laboratory um, in terms of um, you know, how we can research learning and teaching, how we can evidence good practice. One of the things we're quite keen to do is build upon how we currently think about the curriculum and deliver it. To look at how the University of the Highlands and Islands, which is the main university, or really the only university in that region, can contribute more widely to learning and teaching of, uh, uh, in relation to our own learners, but also the community that we sit within. We're involved in various open educational initiatives. Uh, we're involved in OERU. We're, on, um, we're involved in the Open Education and Practices Scotland steering group and project. But we're really starting to think quite seriously about what would open mean at University of the Highlands and Islands? What would open UHI look like as, you know, in a distributed university where we've got an opportunity to distribute the curriculum and, and, and distribute the curriculum in some of the ways we've just looked at from the Edmund Napier model? One of the things we're quite seriously thinking about is how do we learn from some of the current thinking about how we reconceptualize the curriculum and some of the fantastic things that are happening around providing third sector, high, uh, third space higher education, places like the Social Science Centre, places like the Ragged University. We're at a point where we're quite seriously thinking that the way we'll take our curriculum forward internally, but also, be, also beyond the university, is to develop a policy for public pedagogy. Um, many universities will have policies for public engagement, engagement in the research we produce, getting people in the public to engage with what we do, contribute as partners to that work. We think we need to go beyond this. And we think that a natural way forward for universities who, who want to take this seriously is to think about digital space, spaces in the community, the nature of the curriculum, and the whole concept of public pedagogy and how we can realise that and put that into practice. We're coming back to this idea at um, UHI. Um, we're quite keen to learn from the project at Napier, to learn from what Sheila McNeil and Bill Johnson have done around the conceptual matrix of the digital university. And we're keen to take forward, um, as far as possible, as far as we possibly can, the whole notion of the digitally distributed curriculum that has all these features and where the curriculum's extended within and across programmes in the university, within and across the local area, and within and across um, formal and informal learning communities anywhere around the world that our learners might want to engage with or who might want to engage with us. So that, that's, that's the next step for us. And in the next year, we'll be looking at this quite seriously. Why is this all important? Um, it's important for a number of reasons, but I think it's important because um, my own belief is that learning is about creating pivotal moments. Um, one of those pivotal moments might be going along to a talk at the Ragged University about artisan chocolate making and say, right, that's for me. I want to learn about that. Another pivotal moment might be engaging with learners um, from the same university, but from a different discipline area 
and seen that there's actually there's quite a lot of similarities between how we need to think about this discipline and the one I'm in. And learning from one another and getting experience of working with colleagues in the disciplines that they might be working with anyway. You know, business students, um, very often business students when they graduate at some point, you know, some of them go into roles where they're working um, in or with partners in healthcare, engineering and computing, music and, and healthcare and occupational therapy. There's lots of parallels. There's lots of places we know that graduates from one discipline go to, and there's lots of dipl disciplines we know they work with. We need to harness some of that much earlier on within the university, using spaces like this and using our digital spaces. So learning is about pivotal moments, and I think our role as uh, lecturers, as course designers, as those that, that look after the curriculum and, and take charge of designing the curriculum is to ensure that we help support our learners to have a series of pivotal moments and stitch together a fabric of pivotal moments that will see them do well within university, but which will also see them do well and be prepared for the life beyond the university, both more broadly and in the online and, and physical communities and disciplines that they'll become part of. Two concluding provisos which haven't been part of this talk, but which I think we need to think about really carefully. Um, many of our students are coming into university these days more digitally able. Many aren't. Um, regardless, we shouldn't conflate digital literacy with digital learning literacy. Um, and we need to be sure and be very careful and recognise that many students, whether they've got good digital skills or not, will need structured, strong support to learn how to learn in some of the ways we've explored this morning. Similarly, um, we can better support our own teachers and lecturers to rethink their curricula and to think about what's possible using digital and, and, and other kind of third spaces uh, more effectively if we allow them, allow them to experience being a digital learner. That's got implications for the programmes, the, the learning and teaching programmes that our learners, our, student, our staff undertake. If PG Cert's learning and teaching aren't role modelling some of this, at least some of it, then how do our, learn, our, our learners on those programmes, our academics, make informed decisions about how they'll support this generation of learners that's coming through and how they'll support that in their own practice. It's also got implications for staff development um, and you know, um, it's important to run workshops about digital tools and new approaches. It's probably more important to do at least some of those activities online where the academics can experience some of it firsthand and get that nuanced understanding that comes through experience, not from learning about something in a more abstract way. So, a conclusion, um, thanks very much, and where are the third spaces in your curriculum and what will you do there? Thanks. <laughs>